I'm very excited to introduce you to our next guest. His name is Dr. Marvin Marshall. He is an educator, a writer, and a professional speaker, all dealing with the issue of stress and how to manage stress. This is, of course, so important to all of us entrepreneurs who deal with major stress. His major book, his book that he's the most famous for, is called Life Without Stress, How to Enjoy the Journey. He has also written a book called Discipline Without Stress and another called Parenting Without Stress. He has presented in 44 states and 25 countries to schools, universities, uh, governments, international organizations, corporations, all of that. Very excited to welcome you to the show. Dr. Marshall, how are you doing today? Very well, Jim. Thank you. To be specific, normally I answer with great, and then silently I say grateful. I say that mentally because gratefulness is the key to happiness. People who are grateful are happy people. Where does stress come from? Is it self-imposed? Yes, in the vast majority of cases it is. It all comes from two sources. Number one, our senses. You see something and immediately it can prompt an emotion. You hear music, dancing music, it immediately prompts an emotion. The same thing goes with all of our other senses. If, you, if you're a coffee drinker and you smell coffee in the morning, it, it, has the, it, it evokes a pleasant feeling. The same thing if you taste something. The same thing if you touch something hot. So we get our responses from external sources, basically our senses, and from our own thinking. And so... One, in one of my books, my uh, first book, as a matter of fact, I started off by saying, life is a conversation. Interestingly, the most influential person you talk with all day is yourself. And what you tell yourself has a direct influence on your performance, your behavior, and your psychological being. So basically, we get our stress from our senses and our own thinking. When I sign a book, my newest book, Live Without Stress, How to Enjoy the Journey, I suggest people go to the epilogue because the epilogue gives the entire uh, philosophical theory, the approach behind the book, which is, and I say, master your mind. If you can master your mind, you will enjoy life more. And that is the key. It is, if you, regardless of what the situation is, you cannot change, like the collapsed bridge in Atlanta recently, regardless of the situation that may stimulate you, regardless of the impulse that you have, you can always choose your response. In essence, choice ends when life ends. The key is to become conscious of the choices you are making and to act reflect reflectively rather than reflexively as so many people do. And I share an impulse control approach so that you can always be in control and you never, ever have to feel that you are a victim. How much of the stress that we feel do you think actually exists? Or is 90% of it made up, 80, 70, 50? It, it, all of it, it's 100% because that's the way the brain images. That's the way the brain thinks. I'm a little askance for going on a little tangent for a moment to let you know how the brain operates. The brain thinks in images, not in words. So, for example, if you tell a youngster, don't run, the kid doesn't remember don't. He remembers young. To be more specific, to put this in perspective, think of the last time you dreamt. Not that you remember your dream, but chances are you did not think in words or paragraphs. You thought in visions, in illusions, in pictures. The brain thinks in pictures. And right after any thought, it immediately goes into an area of the brain called the amygdala, which is where our emotions are stored. and what happens is, with every bit of cognition, there comes a feeling. As I tried to explain, if you hear dance music, it sets you in, in a mood. 
if you see someone who you've not seen in a long time, an old friend, it prompts a feeling, a, a, a positive feeling. So the objective is to master your mind and your thoughts by three practical principles. The first is talk to yourself in a positive way because people do better and feel better when they feel good. People don't do good when they feel bad. The second I've alluded to, and that is choice. Choice ends when life ends. You will always have a choice of how you are going, uh, of being able to respond to anything. And third, especially with other people and even with yourself, you can control people, but you cannot change them. The only way you can change them is to influence them, and the trick behind that is learning how to ask reflective questions. All right. What happens when we have valid stress? First of all, is there a way to know if we're stressed about something that's valid? For example, you get pulled over, you know you've been speeding, you know you're going to get a ticket. Is that a time to have valid stress? And what do we do in that instance? Well, certainly, what you what you can do is immediately you can control how you're going to react. By the way, a friend of mine by the name of Alex Carroll sells a book on how to how to not be. I have read that book. <laughs> Great book. But the point is, that's a situation at that point you cannot change. You you've been caught speeding and you're there. The, what you can do is to decide how you're going to react to it, negatively or positively. So that's a decision. You're better off acting positively, obviously. And, and ask yourself, what can I say? I, what, I'm going to reflect. How can I respond to this officer? And you want to do it in a positive way. My point I'm trying to emphasize is these three practices, these three principles can help you overcome any stress in any situation. For example, to give you my age, <clears throat> my wife and I will be celebrating our 60th wedding anniversary. I'm very fortunate to have been in love. Wow. Congratulations. Congratulations. I tick, when I tick my wife off, the very first thing I will do is ask myself, what can I learn from this? I have learned in life to make, a lem to make lemonade out of anything. I cannot control my wife. I cannot change her. She's never changed me. Of course, she influences me. And the, 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 the poorest way to influence a, a person is what most people use. It's called coercion. So the idea is not only to influence yourself, but how to influence other people. But in this situation, I'll ask myself, okay, what can I learn from this experience? I'm always learning something. That's one of the beauties of life. You continue to learn and grow. All right. What if we have catastrophic stress, Marvin? That's Not right. getting pulled over by a police officer. Mm -hmm. A child diagnosed with terminal cancer. What are the, mm -hmm. the, is there anything different to do then? What are some of the suggestions you have in that situation? You can do it. My reaction would be the same reaction in almost any circumstance. This is a situation you cannot change. A lot of life hap happens to be luck. Okay, so this is an unlucky situation. What The question then is, what can you do about it? Uh, by way of an example for a moment, I have a video uh, YouTube channel and the, the uh, three-minute video I put on just the other day has got to do, what if you're anxious about North Vietnam, uh, I'm sorry, North Korea or Iran? How, you, how do you, you're, you're anxious about that, how do you handle it? Well, this, the same approach applies to any devastating situation like a, a hurricane or a fire. The first question is, you ask yourself, what can I do about this? Okay, and so you obviously it's a devastating situation, but you can let it ruin your life, so to speak. Or you can say, okay, at least I've got my health. At least nobody has been injured. So you look to what can what 
what can you pull out from this that's going to give you a positive orientation? And it, it's situations like this where where people don't fall victim, where they they persist, they continue to do something to um, to help the situation out. They don't become victims and basically say, "I'm going to give up." A very very simple example is that you take a look at a, the classic. You take a look at a glass of water. Are you looking at it at half full or is it half empty? Of course, if you're an engineer, you say the glass is not big enough. But the point is, it, it's your attitude. Is it going to be? It's, I'm coming back to the same idea of manage your mind. If you if you master your mind, then you're going to be positive about this, even though it's a horrible situation. What can you do about it? You, you'll then become resilient, and the people who do not look at things and what they have control of their lives, regardless of the situation uh, or the stimulation, the resilient people will will persist and live a, a happier life. Whereas, of course, if you look at the negative, uh, you're not going to be happy. Henry Ford articulated beautifully when he said, if you think you can, you can. If you think you can't, you can't. Either way, you are right. Mm, you yeah. can't change. You know, you can't change situations. It's always how you're going to react to them. I do love that saying. Uh, we only have a couple minutes left, sir. I want to ask you about parenting, your book, Parenting Without Stress. I have four children, and just to let you know, their ages are 19, 17, 6, and 1. How do I reduce <laughs> stress in that? <laughs> yeah, thank you for laughing at me. I, I, I know I deserve yeah. it. I'm We're not laughing. very good at strategic planning here. I'm I'm laughing with you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, you're laughing at me because I'm <laughs> crying, sir. I cry okay. every morning, night. <laughs> okay. You can, after this, if you implement what I suggest, you're going to laugh and, and happiness. What happened is number one question: do you do you happen to say no to your kids? Yes, I believe in saying no to them frequently. Right. Here's here's a better way. Instead of saying no, you say not yet. Not yet has the exact same effect as no, but does not cut the relationship. And that's critical with parenting. So All right, what about this reason. question? Uh, can I do cocaine? The hmm. answer is not, not yet. The answer nope. is no. Nope, nope. You can, you can say no, but there's a better way. And that better way is by asking a reflective question, such as, what do you think will happen if you start doing campaign? Let's talk about what, how you will be in two months, three months, and four months, and five months. And here's, here's the point, by way of an example, if I have a moment. You walk into a store, and the salesperson says, how are you today? And you have a natural tendency to answer. You'll be in a conversation with one person, and all of a sudden, the person asks you a question. Do you, do you continue on a monologue? No. You stop and answer the person's question, and that's the key to remember, and here it is. The person who asks the question controls the conversation. So what you do is you think of a reflective question where the, you'll ask the youngster so the youngster will reflect. Here's a simple one that anybody can use when a youngster is angry at a parent. You simply say, are you angry at me or the situation? Now, what you've prompted the kid to do is to stop and reflect. And here's another key point. The emotion always follows cognition. So when I ask the person a question, he's got to stop and think. That emotion dissipates, and now he's going to think about the reaction. And what normally a kid will say, I guess I'm just frustrated and I'm, and I'm taking it out on you. You should never take what a kid says personally. You find out what the problem is and the skill anybody can learn is to be in control by using authority without coercion. Instead of no and cut the relationship, you ask the youngster a series of questions. I mean, I've seen kids will, I will say to a father, for example, the kid is trying to cut the umbilical cord, and the father, of course, has lived longer, so he, he doesn't want the kid to go through what the father considers a bad experience, so he starts to lecture. Now, you can just look at the kid's eyes. The father's intention is good, 
But the kid is saying to himself, my father is trying to control me again. The kid has immediately turned the father off. Good intentions, bad results. You can, you can control your kids, but you cannot change them. You want to change them? Then you learn the skill, and anybody can learn it, of just instead of telling, either sharing, well, I had that experience, blah, 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 or more commonly, ask a question to have the kid reflect. Now, all of your kids are different, right? Oh, yes. Okay, so here's what you do. If you can imagine this, do we have a, a, another moment here? We want to go on a break first. Go ahead. Keep going. Okay. Imagine, if you will, uh, a, 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 a plus sign. At the top of the sign is a thinker. At the bottom of, of the line is a vertical line. At the top of the line is a thinker. And at the bottom of the line is a feeler. On the left, there's a doer. And on the right, there's a relater. Now, from personal experience, I'm a rather cognitive guy. I'm always doing things. So I'm in the, the northwest neighborhood. I'm a thinker and doer. That's where I live. My, my wife is a novelist, and so she's a thinker also, but she's a female. I know if I'm going to have a good relation to her, with her, I've got to listen to her. I've got to be a good listener. Okay, so she's in the, in the northeast corner neighborhood. Our daughter, however, is a feeler and a relater. And when I, and I have an, an assessment on this in my parenting link, but when I started to understand our daughter Hillary's style, and I tried to nurture her nature instead of trying to control her by how I am, our relationships immediately significantly improved. It's the old idea you can take an acorn and you can plant it and you can fertilize it and you can water it. That acorn may grow up to be a giant oak. It will never become a redwood, a palm tree, or a figure. You nurture your kid's nature. The, um, the relationship significantly improves because kids want to be recognized. It's a lot to, uh, to ingest in, one, uh, in a few minutes. It is. It is, yes. Uh, it, it, and it's amazing the, 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 how the kids will change. You know, the, there's this idea about, the, you know, they got the terrible twos and, and, and teenage, and parents have got pr uh, problems with teenagers. In my perspective, the problem is not that the kids are undergoing hormonal changes or are they a kid or are they adult and cutting the umbilical cord. The problem has been, in my opinion, in the vast majority of cases, it's a power struggle. Kids want to, in the vast majority, want to please their parents, so they do what their parents want. Then the kids grow old enough, uh, and they, they want to cut the umbilical cord. And then there's a thing, by the way, called counter-will. Counter-will is the natural human, almost a, 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 a natural instinct to resist being controlled. That's when you see it in the terrible tools and in the teenage years in particular. So if you stop any kind of coercion and you work collaboratively with your kid, this power struggle is not the, uh, the there is no power struggle. In essence, the kid has obeyed you all your life. They're now growing up, and you want to continue to have them obey you, and they don't. And so it's a power struggle. And if you, if you learn how to use authority without coercion, you will not have the problem so many parents have with their teenagers. And the, the trick behind that is learning the skill of asking effective questions. Let me just... Oh, that's good advice for our employees as well. <laughs> we are out of time. How can we find out more about you? Get copies of your books, take the assessment, all of that stuff, please. The website is withoutstress.com. Withoutstress.com. There are lots of free information for teachers, for parents, for living without stress. And, of course, uh, there's a uh, shop also if you wanted to purchase any of the products.
uh, I have this this passion after returning to a classroom of, after 24 years and seeing how poor education is and how many problems they're having and how many things they are doing counterproductive. And I, I decided I, I, I've got to do something. So hence my first book, Discipline Without Stress. And people say, would you please write a book just for parents? Because the discipline book only has one ch- one chapter in it. And so my approach is basically, as, as far as I can tell, it's the only one around that is that shows people how to always stay in control without coercion, how to use authority without to, without coercion, because people resist coercion of any kind. You can and you, you can prove this yourself. I'll start a sentence and you finish it. If I've told okay. you once, I've told you. If I've told you once, I've told you a hundred thousand times. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Telling doesn't work. What you want is you want to share information, but you want to present it in a way to influence, to have the person influence themselves. President and General Eisenhower said it beautifully. The art of influence is to influence the person to influence himself. And it'll never be through coercion. Lots on my website. Love to help anybody I can. Well, thank you so much for being with us, Dr. Marvin Marshall, and we will be right back. 